Hey guys, disclaimer, the following are just my I'm just punkin'. We don't do that here. Cyberpunk 2077. It's very nature is split in two. In more ways than one. It's an alright game that exists in a market that expects nothing less than the golden gift of God. But not all of that can be blamed on some mysterious internet hype machine. Let's not forget the big part CD Projekt Red played in creating these expectations. There are spoilers later. I don't care about spoilers personally, but I haven't made a video on why you shouldn't care about spoilers yet, so I guess I'll put in a warning. I'll say it again once we get there. The Hype Machine. CD Projekt Red was blessed and cursed to be the studio whose name was tied to The Witcher 3. Blessed because it's a budget and marketing wet dream, and cursed because it's a difficult act to follow. But merely creating a popular single-player role-playing game doesn't garner this kind of attention. 1.4 million subscribers for a YouTube channel, and almost as many on Twitter for a game before launch. That's impressive. But the hype for this game is absolutely unreal. Really, it's a multitude of factors. It's not just the Witcher game series fans hyping this up, nor is it the cyberpunk tabletop fanbase finally revealing themselves to the world. Let's take this back to my channel's default. Fury, I, I mean Bethesda. Bethesda holds the keys to a very interesting gameplay formula, one I've spent hours analyzing and discussing on this channel, and it's not uncommon for many in the community to claim that Bethesda has abandoned us. Fallout 76 doesn't bode well, and Fallout 4 had a myriad of problems, and it's almost been a decade since Skyrim. This creates an opportunity for the throne to be overtaken. This extends broader to the single-player role-playing game genre. After years and really decades at this point of being told that the genre is over, that multiplayer is taken over, and that the unnecessary and aggressive monetization of single-player games is the new normal, CD Projekt Red is still proving to the industry that the old ways are viable. The immersive sim crowd looks to CDPR as well. Eidos Montreal was corrupted from making Deus Ex games to making Marvel's Avengers, a game which stains my library complimentary of my new CPU. They hope then that Cyberpunk will prove both the setting and the genre are still viable enough to avoid death by corpo strangulation. And speaking of viable single-player genres, Grand Theft Auto has spent an entire console generation as an online platform for working a surrogate job so you can earn enough money to combat the myriad of griefers and hackers that infest its online mode. Not that that's its intended message, it has no intended message. The only intention is forking over cash to the tune of billions on microtransactions. That's just a fraction of the hype, not mentioning the PC gaming enthusiasts of old, or the console players looking for something exciting to play on their new systems, or the fact that Cyberpunk is capstoning a pretty wild year. You can see a lot of people have a lot riding on this game beyond its quality. The game has to be good, and it has to do well. This encourages contrarians to come along who want or need the game to be bad in order to prove how intelligent they are compared to the plebs who fell for the marketing. Which is not to say you aren't allowed to have a negative opinion, just that you should determine if your opinion's being based on the game itself or public sentiment. This coming from the guy who up to this point has yet to review a game the same year it got released. Yes, Cyberpunk is one of the five games I've played this year to come out in 2020. Of course, there were the death threats. Cyberpunk got delayed an additional three weeks. Now, on the one hand, that's definitely an extreme response that no adult should have. On the other, some companies I've worked for print schedules a month in advance, and considering it was the ever-elusive management that made the decision, I think the response would have been more civil had they made the delay announcement two weeks earlier than they did. It's not like CDPR didn't decide to have a massive zero-day patch, and the game is still, well... The long development. Eight years. Eight and a half years of development. That's not an entirely accurate statement to make, though. Full development was closer to four and a half following the release of The Witcher 3's Blood and Wine expansion, which is still a long time for a game to be in development, but necessary if the bar you're aiming for is playtimes in the hundreds of hours. Slated for an April 2020 release, it was delayed. November 19th's the date now, and it missed. Three more weeks to December 10th. To be honest, I didn't assume anything until I had it in my hands. You'd be seeing an Oblivion video if they had missed it again. And they had the crunch to get the product to market. I feel that. I just want to say this for anyone who doesn't know, but crunch isn't a bad thing. Sustain crunch for months on end with the expectation that if you don't want to slave away 60 plus unpaid hours a week or you'll get fired, that's a bad thing. And if that's what's actually happening, then yeah, shame on CDPR. But working an extra day a week for six weeks is not a sustained crunch. I'm speaking as somebody who recently had to work overtime at my real job. You know, the thing that actually pays me money. And crunched heavily to bring this video to market thanks to paid shill- I mean, sponsored influencers getting copious amounts of advanced time to release their videos before I could even start working on mine. 
the urgency problem. Now, while I would like to cover the story last, unfortunately there's a massive problem sitting between us and a discussion of cyberpunk's world, and that is the inherent conflict between CD Projekt Red's storytelling and open world game design. So to explain this, we're going to use a spoiler free example from The Witcher 3 because it has the exact same problem. I like this game. I enjoy having to prepare specialized oils and potions to fight creatures. I like finding the materials to create my equipment. I like finding places of power and meeting people and hunting monsters. Except oh my god, there's a giant griffin going around. It just attacked this guy and he's lucky we managed to hurt it so it flew off with just his horse. Oh man, it's wiping out entire squads of soldiers too. And the villagers are having run-ins with it every couple days. I bet it kills at least one person every day. Luckily, there's a monster slayer in town here who has to kill it in order to get information on his missing girlfriend. Wait, no, Geralt, why are you solving an arson case? Geralt, this is a tomb. Is now really the time to be looting bandit camps? Surrender. Geralt, somebody's probably being eaten right now. The griffins like to toy with their prey. Eat it. Alive. Piece by piece. Oh, God. See the problem? Well, if you can't, the problem is that the plot regression is creating a pressure that's smothering the open world elements of the game. I discussed this in my Morrowind review, how the desire to write a story that in a traditional, linear narrative would create tension instead shatters it in an open world context. A problem that Morrowind resolved by presenting an opportunity at the end of its first main quest to step off to go do whatever the player wants, as well as opportunities during its first act. To go back to The Witcher 3, once Geralt is deposited into the world proper, there's nothing to stop me from going off on my open world adventure, except the fact that every time I do a main quest, something happens that tries to invoke the timing of the story. Oh man, the Wild Hunt just missed us, they're hot on our trail. Would that be true if I'd gone off adventuring and come back to this quest weeks if not months later? Yes. I have a hard time enjoying the open world because the story's told in such a way that I can't just ignore it. And I have a hard time enjoying the story because the open world keeps trying to draw me away. You'll probably need some better equipment to handle the next quest. Just a couple contracts to earn some cash and then maybe we need to go hunting for these materials to make an item and then before you know it, three days have passed and someone's still wondering when I'm going to get back to them about their missing family. Now of course you could say that's the point, it's about finding a balance and doing what's important, so the pressure isn't bad design, it's the pressure a monster hunter or freelance mercenary would feel living in a world where there's more monsters or contracts than they alone can handle. It's all intentional, right? Wrong. I'm not dodging the griffin fight because I'm trying to balance Geralt's work and personal life. I'm dodging the fight because it'll progress the plot. An arbitrary bit of programming that says it's time to move on. As long as I put off the most urgent thing I could be doing right now, time is effectively frozen. It's hard to, you know, roleplay unless the character I'm meant to be playing as is the most irresponsible human being on the planet. I don't know, and it's because of that arbitrary uncertainty I have to go up the hill and banish a ghost that hasn't killed anyone before I slay the griffin that's actively hunting villagers. Cyberpunk has this exact same problem. It's hard to step off and admire Night City when the next bit of story is being shoved in your face at all times. This was apparent as early as the 2018 gameplay demo, which had problems that are still present in the release version of the game. The world of Cyberpunk opens up once the player reaches Act 2 of 2, but before you can go off on your adventure, the game tacks on a terminal case of imminent death, only curable by the main quest. A terminal case it often reminds you of. That's not a spoiler, by the way, it's the game's premise. We'll get to that, don't worry. Many of the game's jobs present a sense of urgency to what you're doing. I honestly wanted to punch V in the face for the number of times he made a commitment to someone that he would be somewhere without first consulting his calendar to see if this meeting would conflict with the other five people I'm supposed to meet after sundown. What's sad is the game comes with a way to fix this problem. The player has access to a phone and can call and send text messages to characters. Instead of agreeing up front to meet Officer Ward and then setting that job aside for a week because there's been a main plot development, let me, the player, call Ward and set up the meeting whenever I want to, so then there's at least a semblance of control. I want to wager that in the 19 hours I was playing the main story, I, at any given time, had at least four people sitting somewhere waiting for me to show up, and at its peak I would say there were 11 people in Night City just sitting around because I had made commitments to meet them. Once I was done with the main story, I was able to clean this up handily, but up until that point I felt like a circus clown desperately motioning to my fellow carnies to step in and help due to the number of balls I'm juggling. The Gameplay Cyberpunk 2077's gameplay is interesting and prone to about a billion different dominant strategies. Want to run around like a lunatic because double barrel shotguns are apparently still the king of firearms even in the future? Go ahead. Want to stealth around, melee take downing people and hiding bodies? Better hope they put enough body dumping areas in the level. Want to hack into the cameras and turn off everyone's nervous system without even entering the building? It's a lot easier than you think. 
And this thing. This is God's sniper rifle. I call it that because it possesses the ability to shoot through thin surfaces, and thick surfaces, and buildings. Which when paired with the ability to mark people means I can just ping the first person I see, which will highlight everyone around them and proceed to drop an entire area's worth of enemies. You may have seen this thing. It's a non-lethal option, and I can only hazard a guess that it's for the people who like to do pacifist runs. Good luck with that. There's a couple levels where non-lethal really isn't an option, which begs the question of why it's there in the first place. The game does almost nothing with the concept. You will very rarely be asked to avoid killing someone, and sometimes when I did avoid killing people, the game just assumed I'd gone lethal anyways. Of course, this is all in reference to gameplay when it's there, which was mostly in the latter half of my playthrough after the first time I beat the final mission. In the first half, much of the game is going through its most challenging mechanic yet, the dialogue. The dialogue system itself works great. I could tell who I was talking to with what lines, the quick decisions were always interesting, and there were plenty of skill checks with palpable changes to how missions would play out. But the dialogue was just so dense. You can potentially go over an hour before the game remembers it's interactive and sends you to a level. And then when I basically ran out of story missions at the 40th hour, there was next to no dialogue at all. It felt like the open world game design and the storytelling were outright enemies refusing to share in each other's systems. Is this a game about doing minor jobs for people and getting equipment that can be improved, or is this a narrative with tension and stakes? It depends on which of the game's personalities we ask. Did I feel rewarded for climbing Equipment Mountain to the top? No, not really. I found the style I wanted my character to have early on, and the later equipment was used out of necessity. There's no vanity slots here. Style comes at the cost of effectiveness. Something that shocked me was the inability to customize my character after starting the game. We're in a world where full body modification is not only possible but expected, and there's not a single barber to be found in Night City. I had to stick with my corpo hairstyle the entire game that from the start I intended to change as soon as I hit the streets. Oh, but haha, ha, there's a penis option. It's not even a slider, and not the V was getting any anyways. Fucking Pan Am wasn't even my first choice and it just kind of happened. Meanwhile, Johnny was busy cucking me with my own body. I expressed purely platonic interests in Carrie and still got turned down. Meanwhile, River was giving me bedroom eyes for a battle buddy ass slamming he won't perform, and Judy made her labial interests very clear at the end of her quest line. Didn't these guys make the Witcher games? Look who's alive. Hey, did you sleep all right? Good work, V. All style ready. There are three starting paths, Nomad, Street Kid, and Corpo Agent. The difference is 20 minutes of story and dialogue options later in the game. Judging by where the story went, I'd say my choice of Corpo was probably best, as the bulk of the game's plot revolves around dealing with corporations. This is something we'll know more about when braver and more patient souls than I play through the game a second time with a different life path to record the differences. One thing that's missing from the game are some of the other life path options shown in the 2018 gameplay demo. No more childhood hero, key life event, or reason to be in Night City. But thank god we kept the quest markers. Speaking of Night City, it's a great setting. The city uses color well. I like that no matter how dystopic the world becomes, at least the city planner could make things look nice. The city felt like I was driving through about a hundred different albums, movies, and video games. But then I was driving, and it's not great. The best way I can describe it is it feels like how it feels to drive in a Ubisoft game, and they give you one of the best vehicles in the game for free at the beginning of the second act. Bugs. Alright, I'm going to try and avoid just listing a bunch of minor issues the game has, because it has a lot of them, and focus on just the game breaking stuff. While it is pretty disgraceful that releasing broken games and patching them in the first week is standard practice in the industry, I could at least say that in my entire runtime I only had a quest bug its progression once, and it didn't softlock the quest. Most of the bugs I encountered were visual and were fixed simply by quick saving and then loading the quick save, because for some reason there's no quick load button. The game is fairly solid in regards to how it kept running. I was actually surprised to see a Steam guide related to crashing considering how stable my experience was, and most of my footage came from the first five days. I guess it's my fresh Windows 10 install on my new computer thanks to the Morrowind video finally being finished. On the contrary, the game would stay open in the background after closing and had to be killed in the task manager. So what are the big problems? Fairly consistently, I've had an issue with UI elements mostly not appearing, but sometimes not disappearing as well. Commonly, the quick hack indicators didn't load, requiring I reload the save to get them back. A few times, the health bar didn't appear. Once, the lower left items didn't disappear. 
Humorously, one of the first side quests I did after beating the story and setting off for the next 30 hours had a profound effect on those 30 hours. This character is supposed to glitch out on his holo profile. Well, he decided to stick around and haunt all the other character holo profiles as well. While his model is no longer loading inside of their model, the glitched effect remained for the next 25 hours. There was also a point where the game forgot to unload an intentional effect that glitches at the UI, and it lasted a while because I thought it was intentional. At another point, the game started gaslighting me into thinking that an FOV of 70 was in fact an FOV of 100. There were also a number of animation glitches, the occasional T-posing civilian or enemy I can handle, my character T-posing while naked from the waist down while riding a motorcycle less so. Floating props that haven't been deleted were common, and there were even Z-fighting issues with textures on character models. This dragon is supposed to be holographic. Also, without fail, each time I ended the game it would be busy having a dramatic moment and there would be some kind of visual glitch. Uh, this makes sense in context. Lastly, sloped surfaces. If you play this game, jump on a sloped surface. This is what a world without friction looks like. On to performance, it's terrible. My rig is past the recommended specs for 2K, and I'm not playing with any demanding effects on, yet the game could barely crack 45 frames per second. I followed a guide and changed a bunch of settings and only got up to 50. Being big on ray tracing is all well and good, but I can't help the feeling that maybe that effort should have gone towards the fundamentals and not a gimmick used to sell expensive RTX cards. Story time. I'm going to be going over Cyberpunk's main story here. If you care, then here's a timestamp to my conclusion. I warned you. Cyberpunk 2077, more than anything, is about living with imminent death. The game has a lot to say on the subject, throughout the entire game, and I think it handles this theme surprisingly well, if it were a linear narrative. The problem is that the story the game wants to tell, and the genre the game wants to be, are mutually incompatible. This is an unsolvable problem. Our condition starts after a heist gone wrong. We're tasked with stealing an advanced biochip that requires specific environmental conditions to work, but its casing is compromised. The chip is initially implanted in our partner Jackie before he dies, and we take the chip. All is well until we're betrayed and left for dead. Upon our rescue by the bodyguard of the assassinated Emperor Arasaka, we're taken to our Ripper dock who eventually informs us that we have at most a couple weeks to live. The chip's gradually killing us and can't be removed, and it's replacing our consciousness with a new personality, the one of one Johnny Silverhand, a rock star slash terrorist who nuked Arasaka's headquarters in 2023 before having his soul ripped out and put in storage. None of this is actually news if you've seen the game's promotional material. Like I said, it's the premise of the game. The theme of living your life knowing that you'll be dead soon is explored throughout the game. We all live life knowing fundamentally that death is inevitable. Even if you were to become immortal, you'd still have the prospect of the heat death of the universe, or the big rip, or the big crunch being your end. Three endings that all lead to the same certain fate. The thrust of the game's actions is the consequence of Saburo Arasaka, emperor and CEO of the Arasaka Corporation. Each of his children represented some deistic aspect, an intentional design as his goal was in fact godhood. In one ending of the game, after the engram of Johnny Silverhand is removed, it's revealed that Saburo took the place of his killer and son, Yobinuro Arasaka, effectively ensuring his immortality. Yobinuro was intended for this purpose, living his life knowing full well that once his father had a mechanism for soul transfer, his body would be stolen. It's the reason he stole the biochip and, specifically, took with him the soul of the man who hurt his father the most, Johnny Silverhand. We find him sitting in his office, a gun with a single round in it beside him. He's contemplating suicide, a choice we take away from him, a choice that, in another ending, we had made. Suicide is a difficult topic, especially so in regards to the topic of terminal illness. It's something that I think the game handles well, its only issue being that I kinda wish the game signposted that's what the actual choice is. Like, yeah, I knew it was one of the options, but I thought the choice would branch. I thought when we throw the pills away that inhibit the chip from progressing, we'd have another choice, like let the chip take us over or commit suicide. In actuality, it is a choice, just not my first time through as I hadn't done the necessary quests. That's a consequence of the game's urgency problem. Still, I think it's worth it to beat the game as soon as possible, then go back and beat it again once you're truly done to see how differently things shake out. It's a great scene. Johnny, a character who starts off hostile but gradually comes around to the player, respects his decision. 
His opposition to Arasaka turned terroristic after he discovered that they possessed the power to take souls. He says, in essence, that corporations have been taking everything away from common people, and now they want to take away their ability to die. Johnny had lived 54 years in a dreamlike state on the chip, being denied his ability to die by Arasaka. It's not just about being able to die, though. It's about being able to choose. This is the easy way out, and a really tragic ending is while the credits roll, every character you formed a relationship with attempts to call you. Your final choice is to side with Hanako Arasaka, the Emperor's daughter. This would be a betrayal of Johnny's anti-corpo sentiment, but is the root of last resort that can potentially save V's life. Spoilers, it doesn't. After Johnny's removal and an attempt at recovery, the player is presented with a dilemma. The chip, while removed, still did some substantial genetic damage. We have at most six months to live and are given a choice. Arasaka will permit us to create an engram of our soul, continuing our existence but compromising our ideals further. Or we walk away, go home, and live out the rest of our life. Note how I phrased that. If I hadn't told you about the six months to live part, it would seem like we'd recovered. Every time you leave the house, you could be said to be going out to live the rest of your life, because death is inevitable, a fact symbolized by our necklace, a memento to the bullet we took to the head, a bullet we survived thanks to Johnny Silverhand. Once I went back and played another 30 hours, I had another go at the ending. This one had more options. One option is to give Johnny control and ask Rogue for help. She's the best fixer in the city and can organize the raid on Arasaka. The other option is to take control and ask Pan Am for help. If you complete her story, she's one of the leaders of the Aldecados, a faction of nomads who are capable of raiding Arasaka HQ. Each path leads to a final choice. V can take control of his body, but will only live six months. Johnny can take control of the body and live out the rest of its natural life. For each, I chose the other. So as Johnny, I gave the body to V, and as V, I gave the body to Johnny. There are two fairly good endings to this story, and Johnny getting the body isn't either of them. If you go with Pan Am and V gets his body back, he sets out with the Aldecados with all of his friends to try and find someone who can help with our illness. A happy ending for the person invested in the other characters of the world. If you let Johnny go with Rogue and V gets his body back, he takes advantage of the downfall of Arasaka to take Rogue's spot as the top fixer in Night City, and organizes the greatest heist in human history. A happy ending for the person who wants V to realize his ambition of becoming a living legend. Each ending rolls with credits with the characters you've met calling you, yet these endings didn't set well with me. The problem is that the ending dilemma is contrived. Removing the engram of Johnny and V from V's body is not lethal for either party. The only reason there's a choice is because no one thinks this suggests that V take his body back and transfer Johnny to another shard until the day a robotic body can be built for engrams. The game plays really fast and loose with AI, and I think that's the main problem here. Alt, the AI involved in the transfer, glosses over the possibility of either person being stored for the future. I mean, I get it, that would remove the stakes and drama, and it's still a bittersweet ending. Conclusion Cyberpunk 2077 has a lot of problems. I think it's going to be the focus of analysis for some time because there's a lot to chew on here, but fundamentally, here are the core faults of the game. Urgency removes agency. I said this in positive regard to Morrowind, and I say it here in negative regard to Cyberpunk. The game's primary thesis is relying on this urgency. It's a problem with no possible resolution. You could remove the urgency while keeping the premise of having Silverhand live in your head, but it would undercut what the game is trying to say. You could remove Silverhand entirely, and Cyberpunk would join the list of sandbox worlds that don't really have anything to say. Unlike the multitude of bugs, glitches, and performance issues that plague the game, this isn't a problem that's going to be fixed in five years. Leveling is another problem. The game reached a point where I was really starting to dread leveling. I didn't realize until hour 45 that perk unlocks were tied to attribute levels and not the skill levels themselves. So when I wanted to craft some orange colored equipment, I needed to gain six levels to unlock the perk. Because while you can buy an item that resets your perk allocations, you can't reset your attribute allocations. And there's a lot of talking. Is this an RPG or a dating sim? Well, not the latter, I wouldn't call what you do in this game dating. It's amazing because despite how much communication there is, everyone still talks past each other. I play games to get away from this kind of stuff, I don't need characters irrationally ignoring me here too. Even in a bunk-ass Bethesda game like Fallout 4, I could pull out my gun and kill someone for being reprehensible. The game has something to say though, so it won't let me shoot. And there it is. My hypocrisy is bare at last. I laid out my impossible expectation that Cyberpunk would be the chosen New Vegas sequel. Hey, that's not a Bethesda game. Shut up. Ultimately, I wanted Cyberpunk 2077 to fail because then I could take advantage of the chaos to build my online career. That's less of a joke than you may think. I have a vested stake as a content creator to focus on the negatives and take advantage for my own gain.
I tried to avoid reading or watching anything online about this game up to this point because I wanted to create as honest a review as possible about this game, untainted by sentiment or groupthink. Was it worth it? Who knows. I'm coming down from a 7 day dopamine high after the Morrowind video did much better than I could have hoped, so forgive me if I sound melancholic. Thanks to everyone who sticks around for the end for your support. This video was a long time coming and I'm glad to see more people are joining the channel and spreading the good word. See you around. A bit for control. For power, I say. You? There are other ways out besides suicide. What? Therapy? A colossal waste of time. Shrinks hate vehicles. We don't have mothers. 